HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is gaining recognition as a great resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and sales professionals. From Inc.com to MSNBC's Your Business, uh, Fit Small Business, Proven, People First, uh, the podcast is enjoying inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to. And while I am thrilled about that, I know that it is due in large part to the wonderful guests that uh, come on the show and spend some time with me sharing their expertise so that all of you can do better things in your business. Today is no different. Today my guest is Steve Acho. Steve, his staffing company, and his staffing platform help companies, recruiters, and job seekers connect in a more human way with the use of today's technology. His book, Why Technology Recruiting is Broken and What to Do About It has helped put into perspective the problem with recruiting and hiring today. Steve believes at the heart of successful recruiting and team building is a conversation, and technology can help facilitate a better experience. Steve earned his MBA while living in Japan and working for the CEO of Mazda. The published author has consulted CEOs of Fortune 100 companies and currently operates the Detroit, Michigan-based technology staffing firm, Solstice Consulting Group. He's passionate about using technology to be more human and helping, quote, change the conversation, end quote, in the market so that organizations can find better fits and job seekers can find more meaningful work. Thanks so much for joining me today, Steve. Thank you, Diane. I I mentioned to you before we actually um, went on the air that this subject of recruiting is one that we we visit, but we don't really visit it from this vantage point. So I'm really excited that we're going to be talking about this. Sure. And I, I want to dive right in um, because 
the title of your book is Why Technology Recruiting is Broken, and I would like to know why you say that technology recruiting is broken. Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. Well, um, first, I want to let you know that while my company and, and most of the resources and clients that I deal with are very much data and technology experts, um, pretty much everything I'm going to say today and any strategic or tactical advice that I give is going to be um, not just limited to technology. Um, it could be really any kind of, of uh, matching hiring managers and candidates. Um, but the reason that I say it's broken is I've been in this business for a little over eight years and I was really surprised, you know, I'm going to tell a story first. I think there's a version of this story in every industry and in every business. There's, there's a story about a woman who makes a brisket for her family all the time. And the husband sees her make the brisket. He's seen her do it, you know, dozens of times. And every time she does it, she lops off the ends of the brisket, like maybe wasting 20% of it. And then she throws it in the oven. And he finally says, why do you always cut off the ends? And she says, I don't know. My, my mom taught me that way. I'm going to call my mom. And so she asks her mom who taught her. And she says, you know, I don't know either. Your mother taught me. Call your grandmother. And she calls her grandmother and her grandmother says, oh, when we first came to America, we had a tiny apartment, a tiny oven, and the roast wouldn't fit. And so we had the, <laughs> so, you know, the, so the, the obvious moral there is to not waste meat. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think there's a version of that story, right? Like everyone is shaking their heads about something that happens in a business that they're familiar with where they say, maybe at one time doing it this way was important or strategic right. or effective, but it just doesn't make sense anymore. And so one of the things, one of the major reasons that I think that technology recruiting is broken especially is because uh, the start of a conversation between someone that you might hire for your company is really a job description. You sit down and you write a description of a job. We need a salesperson. We need a technology director. We need a whatever. And you have a budget for it. And you write down this job description. And you don't have to take my word for this. Please feel free to scour the web and search any job that you can. And you will find that a vast majority, almost all job descriptions, do not describe jobs. Instead, they describe attributes and skills and experience that someone has to have as a requirement for having a conversation about the job. And that is among the problems that I talk about, which there are only a few, I think, that, that are major that I see. That might be the biggest one because a handful of bad things happen when you say things like, we're hiring a such and such, and in order to have a conversation about this, you must have these skills. It's interesting that no one in their life outside of you know, corporate America or small, medium-sized business America would ever do this. Like, Diane, imagine you were having uh, a party at your house, and you had 50 people coming to celebrate something, and you needed a caterer. You would never think to put an ad on Craigslist or call your friends and say, hey, I'm looking for a caterer. Do you know anyone who has five years of experience with spatulas and oven mitts and convection oven? <laughs> you know, it's like, or, and, and take that example for anything, snow removal, mowing your lawn, you know, landscaping, anything you do, you only wow. describe outcomes and then you look for usually a referral is the best way, right? That's what yeah. most of us still do, whether that's through social media or some other means. But essentially, the conversation is very human. It's just like, I need someone who can achieve these results. Do you know anyone? But that's right. not how the conversation starts, right? And so when people apply for jobs online um, and they're, they're applying for jobs that say, you must have this list of skills, um, I guess the first answer to the question of why do I think it's broken is because uh, the start of a conversation in hiring someone is a job description and the way that they're written now is both not compelling or interesting and it's also a really bad way to start a conversation with someone. And so it's essentially a strategy that says, I'm going to try and weed out the weak. This is what we used to do 40 years ago. We used to, say, you know, the, uh, IBM and, and other companies would take out job ads in newspapers and say, mail me your resume. 
And then some poor person on the other end of that is receiving just envelopes with hundreds of resumes. And in order to make their life easier, they could just literally throw away any resume that didn't have a college degree or an MBA from a whatever school or, you know what I mean? And so they're essentially, they're, they're, without saying this out loud, they're saying, we are committed to a strategy called weed out the week and see who's left. And if you think about, and I'll give you some examples of, of what happens in real life, and, not, and I don't just mean in tech. In tech, for example, the best developer at Apple is almost 10 times more productive than the average software engineer at other companies. The best salesperson at Nordstrom brings in eight times more revenue than an average sales associate. Um, you could go on and on. The best transplant surgeon at a top medical clinic has a success rate that is six times better than the average. So my point is top talent matters in a really bad way to start a conversation with the general public and say, we're looking for top talent is to fold your arms and say, we will only talk to you if you have five years of this and three years of that and a college degree. Does that make sense? Boy, that really does make sense, and I never would have seen it that but way, but really, you're, so you're not really saying, we want to know about your talent. What you're saying is, you need to check all these boxes, and if you exactly. check these boxes, we're going to assume you have the talent. Exactly, yeah. So, so you're essentially, so you're, you're, starting, you're starting by thinking, and I don't want to be too critical, because it really is um, a, a common human default to say, I wanna hire someone, and the first thing you think is, what kind of person will be good? Well, I need someone who has great communication skills, and I need someone who's very organized, and, and all that stuff is true. I don't mean to belittle skills and experience because they are important, but if, if we could switch one thing and write and talk about job descriptions in this way, and, this, and I'm gonna give you kind of strategic and tactical advice at the same time. I don't care what the size of your company is. You could be a one person company hiring one more person or a 50 person company hiring five more. But if you started to write it and thought about it almost as an advertisement, think of what an advertisement does. It doesn't, you know, other than billboard signs who are just trying to get everyone in a certain demographic and, and trying to get a small percentage of millions of, of cars that drive by, you know, most people that are selling to, you know, toys to children are not advertising in Cosmo for good reason. And so um, they're not trying to say, like, let's get in front of as many random eyeballs as we can and then collect uh, you know, a whole bunch of people and then weed out 90% of the prospects and see who's left. So if you think about it as an advertisement, now you start thinking about your target market as if you were selling them something. And you think, how can I write this in such a way that it's compelling for a person who's interested, who's motivated to do this work? And then the second thing you do, and that, that's a little bit more of an art than a science, right? Just like writing yeah. ad copy is, is much more of an art. There are people who are really good at it, and there are people who are, who are not as good, and there's a scale. But this part of it, I think, and, and this is why I say technology recruiting is broken, because with technology, you are always doing something using tech that involves an outcome. You are literally either building, creating, upgrading, securing, transferring, integrating. I mean, it literally starts with one of those words. And so if someone says, so what I do with my clients is I first have them say uh, the most important question that they can answer for me when they're looking to hire a certain person is to answer the question, what are the few most critical things that they have to do in order to be successful? And typically when I ask that question, they'll start with their list of skills. Well, they have to be really good communicators and they have to have five years of this kind of technology. And so I listen and I say, that's great. What are they gonna do with their great communication skills? What are they gonna do with their five years of technology? And what I'm trying to do is get them to start a sentence with a verb because there's no such thing as good communication skills unless they're in context of something. I have good communication skills, but not, you would not put me on the news. I would not be a good news anchor. And that matters. That's a certain kind of communication that involves looking at a lens and coming across, you know, not contrived. <laughs> and I'm not good at that. So I wouldn't be good. And so it's not enough to just list, list a bunch of skills. So as yeah. soon as I start hearing them say three to five at most, things that the person has to do to be successful, 
then we get down to it. And then we can add technology. So don't say five years of iOS development, for example, which is Apple's uh, uh, code that they use. Instead say, we're building an app for the iPhone that does the following. And that's gonna get a developer interested. It's not gonna get a developer yeah. interested if you say, must have five years. And by the way, the other problem with, with having requirements like that, that aren't, where the job description isn't either compelling or it doesn't describe the outcome that the person's responsible for, is that not just that they're qualifying potential people that are a bad fit, I'll just say it short, they're qualifying bad people, not that they're bad people, but they're just a bad fit. There's nothing about having five years of experience in anything that makes you a perfect fit for every job. So the question is, what's the job? And if, you're, if you have the weed out the weak mentality, then you're only left with a handful of people who have these check boxes, as you said correctly, and then you're going to try and figure out if they can do what you want them to do. You should start the conversation talking about if you can do what you want to do. And so, but the other problem with that that people don't realize is that you're also accidentally and organically disqualifying people who might be great. Yeah. And so, you know, I can give you a personal example. I, somebody forwarded this to me great. about a year ago. Um, so my history is I, I lived in Japan for a number of years. I speak the language. I did my MBA there. I've worked for some CEOs, some pretty big automotive companies. And I saw this job posting that said that was for someone in the Detroit area. They were looking for a salesperson to, I believe, call on Toyota or Honda or one of the big uh, Japanese OEMs in the US. And I would have been disqualified because, and I wouldn't have applied for the job if I were even interested, because there was something in there that says, you know, mandatory requirement. And it said something like must have, you know, seven years of, of direct selling experience to Japanese automotive companies. Now, I had, I think I have probably three years if, it, if you are technical about what my job title was, but I certainly would be disqualified for that. And if a machine or a young recruiter who didn't know any better and was just doing what they were told, and that is to, to get rid of resumes that didn't have the requirements, they would be losing out on me. And what if I was someone that was super motivated and capable and interested of doing that job, right? Not only, yeah. like they don't even have the metrics on that. I mean, you know who you're interviewing, you know who's in your funnel, but you don't know who never went into your funnel, right? And that's, that's a problem for companies. That's a, that is a huge point. And, and where, do, where do they get these spans of time? Five years, seven years, ten years. Where, where do what, you know? What's the thought yeah. process that says, "Oh, okay, once someone hits this, then yeah. they're going to be good." Right. Well, I've I've talked to a lot of people about this because I'm I'm trying to understand why they do this too, and um, one one answer that I get is just I, I mean the real answer is that it's arbitrary, um, yeah. and somebody that really <laughs> knows the technology well can usually, um, and, and some of those things are, are fairly close, by the way, like, you know, I would admit that you're more likely to do a good job in the role that I just mentioned if you did have seven years of experience. But the problem is that that doesn't guarantee you'll do a good job. And that doesn't guarantee that someone who has six years and three months or even three years wouldn't right. do a good job. So some person who is really the technical professional who knows the business, who knows the you know, the technology or whatever is thinking to themselves, you really need X amount of experience in order to really get into problem solving with this kind of tool, right? That's the first answer. The second answer is a little less fortunate. And that is that um, it is a way of discriminating legally. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, there are companies that actually don't want to hire people that are over a certain age. And of course, they could never say that or they would get in trouble. And so by saying, by putting a range in there, like must have three to five years of experience, and then they get some, you know, 47 year old man, they can, they can turn that person down because they can say, well, that person's actually overqualified. We, we want someone with three to five years experience. It's a mid-level job. Um, and so they're not really thinking about whether the person is capable and motivated to do this job. They're, they're thinking about what they think they want and what, you know, right. what would seem to be a good fit, right? Yeah, right. It's so weird because It sounds really, common sense, doesn't it? <laughs> 
well, what you're saying what I'm sounds saying? kind of like that. Yeah, and yeah. It just seems like, yeah, yeah. Course, how does it happen? But just, just search the web and you'll see how it happens. Oh, it's happening everywhere for sure. And, and the, the companies that I talk to, the business owners that I talk to say hiring is one of the hardest things that they do. And, and yeah. writing a job description is one of the hardest things. Sure. And that's because actually they want why, good people. The they just don't know how to get them. Yeah, exactly. And there, and there's no one right answer to how to get them. There's lots of strategies. Um, there's certainly referrals, employee referrals. There are more resume databases than anyone knows what to do with, including LinkedIn. There, there are, so people are out there, right? But it's just a matter of yeah. how to engage them. I think you engage someone who is who is indicating that they're open to a career opportunity, but, but is gainfully employed differently than you engage someone who has applied for a job, right? And so those conversations are a little bit different. Um, you're still, of course, respectful and everything else to, to everyone, but you just engage them in different ways. So someone who applies for a job, for example, um, and, and by the way, I, one of the things that I've said that, that sounds controversial until you know what I mean <laughs> is that in some ways you would think technology would make all of this easier because we don't have to mail resumes and, and print yeah. out things and highlight and, you know, do, do all of the work. What happens is it becomes more efficient. So technology makes things more efficient. But the problem with that is if you apply efficiency to something that you shouldn't be doing in the first place, um, it's, it's essentially, you know, kind of like in the roast story that I told, it, it would be like if you and I came up with this great technology that very efficiently cuts off the ends of every roast. So now you can do it faster um, without really any thought for whether we should be cutting off the ends of the roast in the first place. Right. And so one way that, and, and there, by the way, I'm not anti-technology. I'm a, I'm a total tech geek. I'm a first adopter of just about everything that happens. Um, so I'm not negative on it, but I recognize where it causes a problem. And one problem yeah. in the recruiting space is that um, as a job seeker now, if you are someone who's looking for a job, and uh, let me just pick a random technology, JavaScript. So Java is a fairly common technology. So let's say someone's a Java developer, they're looking for a job, they go to uh, any, of the, any of the popular resume databases where they post jobs to look for what's there. So I'm looking for a job, I type in Java developer, and immediately 500 jobs pop up all over the country that say Java developer, and this city and in this, you know, in this location for this company. Well, the job seeker, all they have to do is hit select all and apply all. They don't have to read anything. You could literally apply for a thousand jobs almost blindfolded. Eek. And so the, the burden now is on the recruiter or the hiring manager, who, whatever poor person is collecting all of these, all of these applications. And of course, what do you think they want to do? What are you going to do if you get a thousand applications and you have to deal with them? You're going to look to be as efficient as possible and weed out yeah. as many as you can so that you're down to maybe 50 or 25 or less if you can, right? Yeah. So, so this, is, this is the way that technology isn't really helping us. It's just... Yeah making something more efficient that's not necessarily effective. And I think efficiency without regard for effectiveness is sometimes the default mode of the universe. I mean, most people park yeah. their car really close to the gym and then they go in and they walk on the treadmill for 45 minutes, you know, it's like, <laughs> well, it's efficient. You can get to the door faster, but, but it seems like you came there to walk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it institutionalizes, something that isn't working mm. or, yep. or is, has, you know, had its time in the sun and now needs to be retired. Right. And yeah. I, you know, I, I need to be careful to say that it's not working. People will hire someone even with a really bad method of recruiting because whatever they do, if they actually need a person, they'll, and they have a budget, they'll eventually get someone. Um, and there's a huge cost yeah. to hiring the wrong person and turnover and all yeah. that stuff. But, right. but I guess my, my message and the reason I want to get it across to, to more people is because if you start with a better, more human conversation about the actual work and about whether the person is a good fit in terms of capability and motivation, then what happens is the, um, 
the silo of people that you're talking to isn't just what's left from the rejects in the pile of people who have applied. And so what I always say in the way that we let kind of the, the traditional way that we recruit by putting out a job posting that says you must have these skills and then waiting for resumes to come in and then weeding out the bad and interviewing, you know, some portion of whatever's left is that is actually a fairly efficient way to get the least bad person for the lowest price that you can. I don't mean the worst person. You probably won't get the worst person, but you're get, you're certainly not going to get a top performer having a conversation that way. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So they, yeah. they'll be able to hire someone, but, um, but, but how often will that person work out? And you know, that you know, right. it's actually done pretty well is if you look at um, Upwork and Elance and Guru and Odesk and a lot of these um, online kind of, uh, what do they call them? They're, they're freelance sites, right? If you need a mm -hmm. graphic artist, but you're not hiring a graphic artist, you're writing a book and you need someone to design the cover for your book is a short term project. Yeah. You know, that that's kind of the in between the finding a caterer or mowing your lawn and the corporate thing that we do. And people, you know, do a really reasonable job there. It, it should be obvious that we need to, we need to move this into the the bigger space. But, you know, if, if in that example, Diane, if you were writing a book and you needed a, a graphic artist to do that and you put out a bid on, on any one of those platforms and said, hey, you know, I'm willing to pay X amount of money. I'm looking for a developer. I'm looking for a graphic artist who can design a book cover. Um, and I can, I can give you some tips on how to do something like that if you're interested. But my point is nobody in there that I've ever seen would think to say, you know, must have X number of years of experience with Adobe. Yeah. Or like, I could care less what tool you use. Just design my book right. cover and do a great job and I'm happy to pay you, right? And yeah. so those, that's how the mm -hmm. conversations work when they're, when they're very short-term projects. So for me, the reason I'm up in arms about the technology part is there is no reason in technology that you can't tell me what you're doing, especially in our business where, you know, we have consultants. We're not, we're not like headhunting and necessarily, I mean, a, a small percentage of our work is that, but most of the time companies are hiring, we're like a considered a contract house. So they're hiring one of our um, technology specialists, they know what they need. And sometimes they describe the need in a way that doesn't describe the job. It describes the person. So it says must have, you know, 10 years of Cognos and five years of this kind of database. And honestly, if they won't answer the question of what they're going to do with those skills, I will, you know, uh, respectfully turn down the work because I can't do a good wow. job. All I can do is, right. is send you a resume of someone that has those number of years of work, but I have no idea if they could do the work because you haven't told me what it was. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And in tech, and in well, tech, there's just no excuse, right? I mean, if you're building an app, you're building an app. You don't have to even talk about the tools. You just say what the outcome is, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and I totally get why you're up in arms about this and you're trying to, <laughs> you know, get the point across because you're right. It, it's, it sounds like it should be so, so much easier and better for the outcome that people really, we need to, you know, it's like the school system, the, our education system was created when we were an agrarian society and we haven't right. changed it, but just the society's totally industry. changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. just come on, people. Let's, let's and this, this wouldn't be very hard to change, to be honest. I mean, we've, we, we have some very simple technology that changes it. And, and I, can give, um, I can give you some, some advice on, on just some really simple things that even the smallest company can implement right away. And that is, once you have a job description, however you get people there, so you might ask your friends for referral, do you know anyone, you might pay to... Uh, you know, post the job somewhere, you're going to get a whole bunch of people applying. And the thing that I do, now we have uh, a tool that does this, but the thing that I, let's back up. The thing that we really want to know, whether you're hiring someone that you used to work with, whether you're hiring your nephew, whether you're hiring the CEO's son or someone that you have no idea who they are, but you're just doing your best to get through their resume and interviews and try and figure out if they're a good fit. What are we really talking about? What are we really asking? Well, we want to be convinced that this person is capable of doing the work and motivated to do this job. 
right? I mean, those are yep. the two things, no matter who you end up hiring. And so if you're starting there, then what you do is you describe the job in terms of the outcomes they're responsible for. So let's say we have one, two, three. So we would say, to be effective in this job, you will, and then we put results. You will grow the business by 40% in the first year. You will, and every one of those sentences starts with a verb, right? And then if you really need yeah. to get into the skills, I wouldn't say it's mandatory or required or any like requirements. I would say, you know, you might have X number of years. You might have some experience with this tool or similar, right? And what that allows you to do is not get rid of people who haven't worked on that exact tool or don't have that number of exact years. So then let's say you get 200 applications. What do you do now? Well, since I don't know whether people have actually read the very job that they're applying mm -hmm. for, <laughs> unfortunately, um, we have this system that just automatically replies and it says, thanks so much for your interest. Um, as you can see from the job posting, these are the three things that you have to do in order to be uh, effective in this job, in order to be considered successful. Please write a short, concise sentence under each one that tells me your most relevant experience compared to the objective. And so here I'm actually testing a couple things. First, I'm testing whether they even respond. And if they don't, that's totally yeah. fine. One, one of the things my business partner says that I love is she said, you know, we spend, like companies spend so much time weeding people out. Like that, that's what they do. They, they're, they build systems and they hire people and they say, look through these thousand resumes and get rid of everyone who doesn't have a college degree or whatever nonsense they're doing. She says, they spend so much time weeding people out when people are happy to weed themselves out for you. I was like, that is, <laughs> she's right. Like she's absolutely right. Yeah. Like that's what's happening. I, I get a 3% response rate to that. So if wow. I have 200 resumes, I'm only down to six people who respond and some of them don't respond that well, but most of them do. So if I'm giving it back to them and saying, please let yeah. me know. And by the way, I consider this a very um, rational and very human question. I'm, I'm still trying to ascertain if we are a good fit for one another. I'm not Absolutely. Make yourself to me, right? And yeah, by the yeah. way, the other way that I'm doing that is I'm acknowledging that there are people out there who may not have done the exact thing, but they have portable skills and they're very motivated and they have a great attitude. And that's the place to tell me. And I'll, I'll give you an example that's probably from your own personal life. People who have achieved any amount of excess. And, and I'll, I'll put you and I both in that category, have likely been in roles or taken on projects that by all outside accounts, we were not quote qualified for. What qualifies you, or I should say, before you started this podcast, how, like what qualified you to start a podcast? How many podcasts had you started <laughs> successfully before this, right? Like we yeah. would all give up on anything successful before even trying it if we had to have the exact experience the first time, right? Yeah. So this yeah. gives you the place to say, um, and I'll use you as an example, if, if you're applying for a job that's on a radio show, well, Let's say you've never worked on a radio show, but you say, here's the most relevant thing I've done. I started and ran a podcast and did every single technical and business and administrative thing that you have to do in order to make this successful from, from this to this, from advertisers to, you know, marketing to, I mean, those are all very, like I, I would go for that resume before someone who just said, well, I check all the boxes. I have 10 years in radio. I know how it works. Right. And so yeah. that it gives that person the opportunity and it also gives them the opportunity to weed themselves out. So to either not reply right. because they don't even remember that they applied for this job or <laughs> to weed themselves out by, I'm kind of testing them on, on skills that matter. I don't need you to tell me that you have good communication skills. I'd rather that you showed me and so if I'm hiring someone for, let's say, you know, Apple is one of our clients. Well, I'm not going to have somebody representing my company at Apple when their response to something from me that starts with, please write a concise sentence that tells me dot, dot, dot. 
has, you know, six paragraphs and is obviously something they copied and pasted from their resume. I'm also not going to have one, you know, where somebody responds and there's seven words and five of them are misspelled. It's like, I don't have to, you don't have to tell me you have attention to detail or you don't. I can see it right there, right? right. So I'm testing right. for the very skills that are important without, like, attention to detail is important. I don't need to ask. So how attentive are you to details? You're showing me. So that, I that's think this is... Yeah, so I have to take a quick sponsor break, but I just have to say that I really, really, really love this concept because this is the thing that people struggle with, that anybody can say what they need to say. They can answer the questions to get the job, mm -hmm. but the question is, are they really the right person for the company, for the job? Can they really do the job? Right. And so having people, um, having the opportunity to allow people to exhibit what they can and can't do really tells you. And that's the thing that, that hangs um, hiring managers and, and business owners. That's the thing that hangs them up. They don't know whether the person can actually fulfill the position. Sure. So before you respond to that, I'm going to take yep. a quick sponsor break and then okay. you start the can. Okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio, entertainment, and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 80-20 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth Explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today, we're speaking with Steve Acho about improving the hiring process, not necessarily through technology. So, if you want to respond to, to what I said, that's cool. If not, um, I would really like to hear some, some, of, some more of these strategies and tactics that, sure. the, that organizations can be using. Yeah, for yeah, hiring, for sure. Okay. Well, on the, on the hiring side, um, just to kind of recap what I said, I think, you know, the, the biggest thing, if you look at the first, like, my, my book is kind of laid out in why technology recruiting is broken. So I spent about half the book ripping on it, <laughs> ripping on the industry. <laughs> um, and then there's a bunch of jokes and not really jokes, but but actual real emails that I've received that are that are funny. Um, and then the second half is the what to do about it. And so, you know, the first couple things I think are just conceptually what's broken is that we continue to have a strategy of weed out the weak. And that's obvious because all of the job descriptions, sorry, not all of them, many or most of the job descriptions simply just don't describe the job, they describe skills. And so what to do about it is to make sure that you write a job description and talk about a job in terms of two things. One, that it is compelling to the person that would be interested in doing that work. And two, that it actually describes the outcome and what work they need to do. And I can give you a little mental exercise I've given to some of my clients before um, when, they're, when they're looking to hire full-time employees uh, long-term. And what I do, um, because it's, it's actually difficult, it's a hard part of the conversation for me because I find people can't get it out of their heads because they've been doing it for so long or they've been trained that way, or maybe they actually disagree with me, but they really believe that nobody with less than five years of X or nobody without a master's degree in computer science or whatever, whatever it is that they're stuck on um, would be able to do the work. And so what I do to kind of get them out of describing the person, which is what that is, rather than describing the job, is I say, forget the job uh, description for just a minute. And I want you to imagine that you hired the perfect person today, and that candidate came from me, and 90 days later, three months into their job, on the same day, you have a call to me, and you're gonna either yell at me or you're gonna thank me, and you have a performance review with that person. So now they've been working for you for three months. You decided to hire them. Um, what would happen in that performance review? What would have to happen for you to say, wow, you've done a great job. This is awesome. I can't wait to work with you more. 
what would make you call me and say, you know, you nailed it. This, this is really the most capable and motivated person. And I guarantee the answer to that question isn't that they had 90 days more of Excel or whatever experience that they said on the original uh, job description, right? So, so if they required that someone has three years of experience in Java, I can almost guarantee that there's no such thing as a performance review 90 days later that says, uh, thanks so much for coming. You've been doing great work. And I can tell because now you have three years plus 90 days of Java. So <laughs> go back to your desk and keep kicking butt. That doesn't happen. It, it's actually called a performance review. So we're reviewing people based on their performance. We should try and hire them based on their past performance and the best we can possibly do at trying to ascertain whether they're actually capable and motivated to do this work. And so that, that's just the start of it, is just to have a compelling job description that isn't boring and one that describes the outcome. Now, the second part of that is really to have some kind of a system, um, and the way I'm saying this is very intentional, um, not to weed out people, but to actually organically qualify the most capable based on the skills that are important. And so, you know, whatever, th there are multiple ways to do this the way that we do it, because we're usually in tech and we're usually in um, working through, you know, LinkedIn and some of these different systems or even other agencies that might be pitching their consultants. Um, the very first conversation that I want to have is simply uh, a response to why they feel. I'm going to give them a chance to tell me why they are excited about and why they feel they are capable of doing this work. And in that answer, it can't just say five years of experience. It has to have, there has to be some outcome. So if, you know, it, it becomes very easy sometimes in tech because if, if someone says, well, I want you to build me uh, a consumer facing website that can, uh, that can sell these kinds of products and that can transact the, that can conduct a transaction online, right? Well, I don't really have to dig into someone's personal history and years of experience and education. I just say, hey, point me to the most relevant thing you've done. And then they show me a website and I'm like, wow, that's cool. That's what I need you to do. I need you to build a website <laughs> that sells products like these, right? And then we can talk about the, the real specifics of mine. Um, and so, by the way, if, if you ever, uh, I'm going to give you one more kind of tip here for, for everybody. Um, if you're ever using any of those e uh, freelance sites where you're hiring someone mm -hmm. um, just for a specific short-term project, like the example I used was uh, designing a book cover. Um, yeah. If you've done that, you'll notice that uh, there are a good amount of people around the world. So in every time zone and every country that are bidding on it for something like the one I just mentioned, you'll have a whole bunch of people that'll bid, you know, I'll do this for $25 and someone else will do it for $2,500 and everywhere in between. So one of the first things that I do is when I write the project description, I make it as short as I can. And I say, I'm looking for someone to design a book cover that has these specs. And it's, uh, this is the title and it's about this. Um, it's in this industry. And then I put in all caps, very important, please read this first. I put this right at the top and it says, in order to apply for this, please, or in order to bid on this project, please send me one link to only, and only one link to the most relevant project you've worked on. Do anyone who sends more than one link will be disqualified. Okay, so that just allows me to see who's actually reading it because attention to detail is important. And I'm not gonna ask someone if they're attentive to detail because I don't know them. So what happens is about 80% of the, of the bidders come on there and they just copy and paste their entire portfolio and they send me links to 750 things that they've done. And, and so it just tells me right up front that they've never, so I can just ignore 80% of them, right? Well, then what I do yeah. is I start looking at their history on there and how many um, you know, clients have said good things about them and their ratings, and then I pare it down even more. And then I'll have a, you know, kind of a conversation back and forth with a couple people. But, but I'm paring it down fairly quickly. The, the, the first thing that people notice when I tell them that you should describe the job in terms of outcomes and you shouldn't be, you know, so quick to, to just uh, exclude people 
is they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. I already get 200 applications to begin with. Now I'm going to get 500 applications, you know, which is, which they're right. If, if you don't put those things on there that stop people who have less than X number of, you know, check boxes, whatever they are, you're probably going to get more applicants, but that's not really a problem for me because I don't look at any of the applications. I only look at their response to my personal email to them. So it goes out to them and it says, thanks for your interest. Let's start a conversation. Tell me why, tell me what you've done that's similar to this and why you're interested in this. And I'm happy to talk to you about it. And within 24 hours, it goes down from a thousand to about seven or eight people. And yeah. I didn't really do any extra work. I just allowed people right. to disqualify themselves. And I can tell you that what happens is my network grows fairly quickly and it also grows with what I'll call like the top three to 6% of the market because those people that are replying um, and sometimes I get replies that say, you know, thank you for this. And now that I look closer, I think, you know, I'm more of a, an architect, not an administrator, or I'm more of a developer, not an architect, but this is the kind of work that I want to do. And uh, awesome. I pick up the phone and I, this is someone that can articulate what he or she is interested in doing, what kinds of problems yeah. they want to solve. Now they're part of my network there. I have experts in all kinds of different technologies just for doing that. So that is another, so, so, I mean, just another fabulous point in this that even because what, you know, we talked about at the beginning, which is so true is it's having the conversation. It's starting the conversation. And it, so doing it this way, you can start a conversation with someone who says, okay, this really isn't my thing, but then you're building that foundation of people who um, have some of those um, attention to detail, work ethic, you know, mm -hmm. that, that skill set that is separate from the actual, you know, job, whatever it is they're going to be doing, but really mm -hmm. shows you who the good people, the good workers, whatever you want to call it, are mm -hmm. who are out there. Right. Wow. The more fitting people, I would say. Yeah. yeah. But, but in general, yeah. they, they just have a better work wow. ethic and some of these basic things too. You're right. And, and on the other side of that, do you, do you want to talk about the, the people that are looking for jobs or career yeah. jobs as well? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the other side of that, because I believe that in the end, every conversation ends up being one that is ultimately about whether it's a good fit for both sides, um, both with logistics, you know, the, the location and the duration of the role and, the work that they're going to be doing and everything else, but, but also capability and motivation. Like, are you really motivated to do this work for this kind of companies? And it does get into, you know, you, you do get into certain things that are just bad cultural fits. It doesn't mean bad people, but you can imagine that a startup environment, a well-funded startup that has 10 employees and they're all sitting around a table and bumping elbows is a very different environment than like Ford Motor Company. And there isn't one that's, that's better or worse, um, but there certainly are things that, there, there certainly are people who are top performers who will not perform well because of certain things like that, certain quote yeah. cultural fits. And, and when I say culture, I, I really try and define um, the elements that make up culture. And I think the most important attributes of it are size of the company and growth phase so a one-year-old company is different than a, you know, three to five to 10-year-old company, which is different than a Fortune 100 company. And then the other one that really matters is the manager and the style of the manager and whether that jives with the person. Those two things right there will, I mean, you can take someone who is a consistent top performer and they will underperform if those two environments are not right for them. Again, there isn't a right or wrong, but those are things to think about too. So for those looking for work, you know, the more you know yourself and the more you know what kind of environment you want to be in and the more, um, I think business comes down to just problem solving, right? Like everyone yeah. who's listening has a job or does a job um, to the extent that it solves a problem for someone. And so the more each of us can figure out what problems we love solving and we excel at solving, hopefully better than most people, well, we're, you know, pretty much always employable. So you, you get to take your pick. And so my advice to people who are both, you know, younger and maybe just out of school or who don't, 
don't have as much experience all the way through to professionals who are mid-career who are maybe looking for a career change is, is this. Don't worry so much about what you don't have in your past, but worry about what you want to do and as soon as you can, start doing it. And so I'm, I'm typically talking to people that are in tech. So I'll just take as an example, you know, iOS development, because that's an easy one, De developing apps for the iPhone or for Android, right? Well, if someone okay. says they're interested in that, I do not give them, a young person even, I don't give them a pass um, for bringing up that old catch-22 of, you know, well, companies only want people with experience, but you only get experience by getting hired by a company, right? Sounds, sounds like that makes sense. But in this day and age, if you have an internet connection, I mean, go to the library and literally free of charge, you can learn how to code in iOS. And then my biggest advice is to err on the side of actually doing projects. So go to your next door neighbor and build their fishing website for their, you know, little fishing group, do whatever you want, you know, do, do whatever gets you to outcomes, go, um, go to a local charity that you're interested in and say, I want to help you. I want to build something for you. Um, and then at the end of it, you'll have whatever, uh, you know, skills and experience and education you have, but that kind of thing, if you can get to a hiring manager or any kind of person that's hiring talent, whether short-term or long-term, they're going to love that you were proactive, that you went out of your way to learn something, and then you actually use the skills that you have to build something. Always err on the side of that. You're always going to come out ahead. And by the way, you might get hired by the very people that you're doing free work for, or you may come across contacts. Um, right. You know, I mean, all, all you have is really like the three R's, right? Rolodex, reputation, resume. Well, you're yeah. actually increasing all of those things when you work for free, doing work that you love doing and you want to excel at. So right. to me, that's in some cases better than a college degree, especially if you can't afford college. Yeah. Right? So yeah. there are multiple ways yeah. to do the thing that you want to be able to do without saying, well, first someone has to pick me. To, to hire me and then I'll learn, right? right? Like you get to pick right. yourself. Boy, and that's so empowering and, and really gives, I mean, this whole thing is empowering from, from the side of the employer to change the narrative so that you're really, you're letting people self-select out and you're really learning about the people who um, really have the skills that you're looking for. And then from the employee standpoint, because when you can take control of your future and take control of your job search, it, it works better, right? You're not at the mercy of people who you're sending 8 million resumes out and <laughs> on the internet and they're falling into that black hole that then never to be seen again. And that's a really unfortunate thing because I do talk to people who are friends of friends. And I just talked to a guy uh, a month ago, who's a friend of a friend. So a guy that I don't know, very high level CFO of a company and his company just got bought out by another company and they're bringing their own CFO in. So he's for the first time in, you know, 20 some years on the job market and he's applied for just dozens of jobs. And he's like, I, I didn't know this happened, but I've never heard back from anyone. And I said, well, you know, don't worry about that. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but the truth is, um, your resume may never have gotten to a human because there are just machines now that just say rule out anybody who yeah. doesn't have this word on their resume seven times. Um, or if it's not a machine, it's just the lowest paid worker that they can find that say, hey, you're a recruiter now. So here's what you do. See these 300 emails? Look at each one of them <laughs> and just delete every one that doesn't have, you know, doesn't fit into these check boxes. And, right. you know, forget that a monkey could do that. It's just not useful. It's just the equivalent of wasting meat for no reason because somebody used to have a small oven. Exactly. I so love that example. I, I just thought that was terrific because it, it really, it just drives the point home so clearly that some things are just, you just got to stop doing. They just are not effective yeah. anymore. They make no sense. Right. Wow. And I think everybody oh, has a, a version of that in their life or their work. They can shake their head and go, sure. oh, yeah, I know enough about this to know that this should not be done anymore. 
Exactly. That's exactly right. So, Steve, I really appreciate you sharing all of this. I feel like, um, well, I, I know I've learned things, and which lets me know that the listeners are learning things too, but it's, I'm seeing it so differently now that, than I have ever, and, and I used to do a lot of hiring. And so I, it, this is really invaluable to the audience. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah, thanks for Will having you me. let the listeners know where they can get your book and get in touch with you and anything Absolutely. you want to tell them? Yeah, cool. thanks. Well, I'm happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. My name's just Steve Acho, A-C-H-O. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy to find me on just steveachoresources.com. And I wanted to let you know that just for your listeners, um, I have a URL that just has a handful of freebies for them. So there's a, a summary of my book that's very short. There's a video that helps with hiring and getting hired. And I'm also happy to do a free consultation. Um, and that is just, uh, it's kind of got the abbreviation of your podcast, Accelerate Your Business Growth. So it's steveachoresources.com slash A-Y-B-G. And I think um, you're going to have that in the in the show notes too as well, right? Show notes. Yep. Yep, I great. am. That's really great. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I also like to thank our listeners. You're the folks we're doing this for, as well as our sponsor. Uh, to get a free trial and a free audio book, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth. Continue to prosper and be curious and uh, try things a little differently in the future. And until we meet again, another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth. Goodbye and good day. The world's best-known investor and Wall Street expert, Warren Buffett, once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel.